Hi, hi. Uh, yes, yeah, so my name's Liz. Uh, by day, I work for a company called Aqua Security, and we help enterprises make their container deployments secure. But today, I'm not going to talk about containers, I'm not going to talk about security, I'm going to talk about debuggers. And uh, you might be thinking, why? how did she get to talking about debuggers? How did that happen? So at GopherCon earlier this year, I did a talk about syscalls. And as part of that, I used a well, a system call called ptrace. And ptrace lets one process observe and control another process. And it's mostly used for two things. One of those is system call tracing, and that's what I looked at at GopherCon. And the other is breakpoint debugging. So I was still kind of curious about that. And so today, that's what I'm going to explore. So ptrace is this really powerful system call. And if we look at the syscall package in Golang, it gives us some clues about some of the things we can do with ptrace. Um, there's lots of interesting functions here, like being able to get registers and being able to change data with poke data uh, inside our target process. So we're going to use some of these functions to build a breakpoint debugger. How many of you have used a debug debugger in your lives? Yeah, most of you, right? So today we're going to figure out how they're working under the covers. And in order to do that, we need to have a little bit of a talk about how your Go source code relates to machine code. So every line in your source code gets translated during compilation into some number of machine code instructions. And when your binary is running, there's a CPU register called the program counter that points at the next instruction that's going to get run. So normally, that's just incrementing along, moving to the next instruction as we go. And if you were going to call to a new function, it wouldn't just be incrementing to the next place. It would be going to wherever in memory the first instruction from that new function happens to be. Now, if we want to set a breakpoint and we want the debugger to stop, or sorry, we want the, the process to stop, uh, we replace the first byte where in the instruction that we want to stop at with a particular code. It happens to be hex CC. It's also known as interrupt three. And when the execution hits that particular code, Execution stops, and it issues a breakpoint trap to the debugging process. And that's all well and good, except we had to figure out which machine code instruction to put the breakpoint at. And as humans, that's not much good to us. We want to put the breakpoint in our source code. So we need some kind of mechanism for mapping between the source code instructions and the place in machine code where they map to. And fortunately, we have a library in Golang that will help us called uh, Debug GoSim. And so let's use that to build a debugger. Now, I have the beginnings of some code here. You'll have to forgive my uh, global variables. This is going to be the debugger, and we're going to be debugging a target program called Hello, which we'll see in a little while. Right. So the first thing we're going to do is look at the symbol table for this uh, hello executable. Now, the symbol table is what you can generate using this debug go sim package. The mechanics of how it goes about getting the symbols out of the binary are not very interesting. So you can look at this code. That it's all going to be on GitHub, so you can look at it later. What's more interesting is what you can do once you've got the symbol table. For example, you can look up a function. I am pretty sure we have a main package, and it's going to have a main function inside it. And we will get back a function structure. That function structure has a field called entry, which is the address of the first machine code instruction inside that function. So uh, we could, for example, print that out. My, no, it's not going to work. I've got these little touch bar keys set up that's supposed to do printf for me, and it just decided it's not going to work. So I could say this is going to be address, oops, and 
uh, so make it like that, and we'll look at the address of the first instruction. So that's going to give us, if we build it and run it, that should tell us the address in memory of the very first instruction that corresponds to main.main. .main. Not very helpful to us because as humans we can't really read that. So we can use another interesting thing to go from a program counter address to the line in source code where that was defined. So we take that address entry and we get back a file name, a line number and a function structure again. And we can print that out. So we'll get uh, this function is at line whatever in whatever the function, uh, whatever the file is called. So that's going to be the function name, line, and file name. So we can run that. Go build. So that tells us that main.main .main starts at line 5 in our source code. I think it's time we started looking at the source code. Uh, here it is. Line 5 is indeed where function main starts. So that's kind of useful. We can also go in the other direction, and we can go, uh, let's say we want to find out what's at line 22 in our source code, and we can use uh, line to PC to go in the other direction. So given a file name and a line, we can get back the program counter of that first uh, address. Um, we get a function structure and an error that I'm going to ignore. And we can print out the same uh, information. And I've lost my mouse. There it is. Let's clear that. And. So that tells us that uh, there's a function called f3 at line 22 in that particular file. And we can check that out. So we can see main calls f1, f1 calls f2, f2 calls f3, and f3 does indeed have line 22 within it. OK, so we've got this symbol table, and we've been able to move backwards and forwards between the machine code interpretation of it and the human readable interpretation of it. So now I want to actually have my debugger run the binary. So I'm going to have a little function that I've pre-written a bit of to help us. So we start by setting up this uh, command structure, which says we're going to run that particular named executable. We'll war up std in, std out, std er, so we can see what's going on. And then here, we say we want to use ptrace on this executable. The start uh, function actually creates the process for this uh, binary to run in. And then we'll wait for something interesting to happen. So oh, I'm going to just comment out uh, these lines up here, because we've seen what they do, and we don't need to see them anymore. So hopefully, I save that. and. Build it and run it. OK. So inside run, we started the process for the hello executable. And uh, wait returned with this trace breakpoint trap. So what actually happened was the process got created, the trap happened, the debugging process saw that, wrote out its, its little commentary about that, and then the debugger finished, and it allowed the hello executable to carry on and type out hello.go, et cetera. So now I want to put a breakpoint in. And we'll put a breakpoint break at that um, line 22. Uh, in order to do that, we're going to use syscall ptrace poke data. So we're going to basically change data in this running executable. We are going to put it, put our code at the address that we found that corresponds to line 22. And I've got uh, defined up here somewhere. Yep, that's the hex cc byte that we need to put in place to say this is where we want the breakpoint to be. I need to give it the process ID, which comes from here. OK. So that should have put the hex code that's going to create the breakpoint into the right place in the right 
line in the machine code. Um, if I was doing this for real, I would want to keep a record of what I'd just overwritten, because I have literally overwritten the first byte of an instruction. And maybe that would be important. Who knows? So um, I would normally want to keep a record of that. But for now, I'm not going to bother. The next step is to let the uh, target process continue to run, ptrace cont. And uh, we're going to wait for something to happen. Wait for on that process. And when something interesting has happened, I want to uh, look at the state of the uh, CPU registers. So I can do that with syscall ptrace get some registers, or get all the registers, in fact, for that process. And we put them in a structure called regis. And I think we should print out some of that. So we can say we stopped at uh, an address. And now, it's called our IP, IP for instruction pointer. That's just what it happens to be called on an x86 processor. Instruction processor and program counter are essentially the same thing. So I think it's time we ran something, check that things are still working. So um, we'll build it, we'll run it. And yep, it stopped at some address that, as a human being, I don't know what that particularly means. Oh, I've spelled stopped wrong. That's Silly, never mind. Uh, let's fix that. Um, but we can convert that address just like we did up here. So we can see where we actually did stop. Uncomment that. And we're going to pass in the address that we've got in the instruction pointer. Okay. Build it and run it. OK. So we have been able to stop the program successfully with a breakpoint at line 22, which happens to be in the middle of the function f3. So now I'd like to get a stack trace from, uh, that shows us how we got to line 22. What functions did we go through in order to get to that point in the code? So we need some more. Uh, some more knowledge about CPU registers to do this. And the two registers we need to know about are the stack pointer and the base pointer. So the, these both point to some addresses in memory, and the range between them is the current stack frame. It's what the current function can use as a kind of scratch pad for the data that it's currently working on. It might put local variables there, um, the parameters that it got passed, the space for any return values that it's going to have to pass back to the calling function. When we call from one function into another, interesting things happen. So one is we put the current program counter address onto the call stack. So that's basically saying, if we weren't about to jump off to a different function, this is where we'd be executing next. So it's what we're going to start executing from when we return back from the function we're about to call. We update the, um, uh, or rather, we put the current base pointer value onto the stack. So that tells us what the base pointer is right now. And then we update both the base pointer and the stack pointer. This is basically giving the new function that we're about to call a new stack frame to write its own data into. So the base pointer now points at the top of the current stack frame, and that points back to the one before it, and so on and so forth. So we can basically traverse this call stack to find out uh, well, what each different stack frame is by following base pointer to the stack frame and then stack frame to its previous stack frame. And at the top of each of these stack frames, there is an address which corresponds to a machine code instruction inside the function that we're going to go back to. So we can use those addresses to convert back into human readable uh, source code locations. And with that, we'll get a stack trace. Now, because I've only got three minutes left, uh, I have slightly cheated, and I have created a function to do this for us. 
Um, but this takes the symbol table we were using before, the process ID, and the current, oh, that's lowercase ridge, uppercase instruction pointer, and the current stack pointer, and the current base pointer. And we build that and run it. Ladies and gentlemen, we have built a debugger and created a stack trace in about 15 minutes. It's pretty cool, right? <laughs> now, I obviously missed out quite a lot of um, detail that you would have in a conventional production-ready debugger. Um, there is, in my GitHub re repo, slightly more detail. Um, that debugger from scratch will let you do things like carry on running after your breakpoint. Very exciting and very useful. It will let you set breakpoints. I um, referred a lot to material that I found from uh, some posts. Particularly, I wanted to shout out to Michal Levitsky, I hope I've said his name right, and Phil Pearl, both of whom had some Medium posts that were really useful for me in figuring out how I could use ptrace to do this. Uh, finally, please go ahead, play with that code to your heart's content. Use it to learn how debuggers work. Don't use it to actually debug your programs. Use a proper production-ready <laughs> debugger to do that. Uh, with that, uh, I wish you a very wonderful last couple of uh, talks, and uh, I hope you've learned something about how, how debuggers work. <laughs>